Welcome to our discussion of the judiciary, specifically the federal court system. Uh, so we'll look at a nuts and bolts overview first, and I think the first thing that we really need to clarify is that the Constitution is actually pretty vague about the judicial branch, uh, where the Constitution is very specific about what the president can and can't do and what Congress can and cannot do. Uh, the judicial branch uh, has some specificity in terms of how justices are appointed and the fact, as you see here in Article 3, that it says there's a Supreme Court and inferior courts, but really the rest is left up to Congress. And Congress started doing that in 1789 with the Judiciary Act of 1789, uh, which has been updated several times since. So here are some things to remember from that act and from the updates. The federal courts have limited jurisdiction. They can only hear certain kinds of cases, and we will talk about what those are. There's a three-tier system in terms of how you move through the general trial courts and appeals. That goes from the district court, which is the most common trial court, to the circuit courts, which are the most common intermediate appeals courts, uh, and usually the final stop for appeals. Uh, and the Supreme Court, which is the final appeals court, um, it does have some weird original jurisdiction, cases that are heard there and only there, uh, but we'll talk about that. Um, and then broadly, as I mentioned, Congress defines what the Supreme Court can hear as an appeals court. So appellate jurisdiction means the ability to hear appeals from the circuit courts below. And this is typically what we think about when we think about uh, Supreme Court cases. But there are also cases, usually only a couple a year at most, that are original jurisdiction cases. And these are cases that start and end in the Supreme Court. Um, and they are usually having to do with one state suing another state. Um, and for the duration of this um, lecture, understand that SCOTUS means Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and so we will be referring to the court or SCOTUS uh, interchangeably, but just when you see SCOTUS, know that that means Supreme Court. So what gets heard in federal court? This is a very uh, broad overview of the federal court system. So as I had mentioned, these are the district courts that I had mentioned that are typically where you would start. You would go up if you had an appeal to the appeals courts. There are 94 district courts uh, and there are 12 appeals courts. These are geographic. The district courts, there is at least one in each state. Some states have two um, and some um, districts have divisions. So in Michigan, we have an Eastern District and a Western District, and the Eastern District has a Northern Division and a Southern Division. Uh, the appeals courts, there's 12 of them throughout the country, um, and then up to the Supreme Court. There are other specialty courts like Tax Court, Claims Court, International Trade Court, and then the Armed Services. Uh, they have their own procedures. We will be focusing on this track right here, which is the bulk of the cases. So federal courts generally de deal with two types of cases, civil and criminal. Civil cases are lawsuits between individuals or organizations that are based on contracts or civil laws or constitutions. This is quite literally when someone says, I'm going to sue you, probably what they mean, a civil lawsuit. A criminal case is when the government charges someone with a crime. Uh, and that can be federal or state uh, in nature. The other cases, which usually fall into one of these other courts, are things like bankruptcy cases, trade infringement cases, uh, patent and trademark infringement, military tribunals. These usually have their own specialty courts or subcourts. So you can see Michigan is divided into two districts. This is the Eastern District, and then you can see the court locations in the Eastern District and the Western District. And then this is the circuit court map. Notice Michigan is in the 6th Judicial District uh, Circuit, or uh, it's not d District, Circuit, uh, along with Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So determining whether something is a federal case or a state case uh, can become kind of tricky. In fact, there are lawyers that don't always know the difference. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, for our purposes. There are two types of cases that we'll be dealing with federal cases. There are civil cases and criminal cases. In civil cases, there are two ways you can have a federal case. Otherwise, it's a state case. 
Uh, the first is subject matter jurisdiction. And what that means is there is a federal law that is implicated in your lawsuit. So if you are suing an employer for violating uh, the Federal uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, let's say they terminated you and you believe it's on the basis of race, this is subject matter jurisdiction. J diversity jurisdiction is a civil claim between two parties who are residents of different states and involves a matter of $75,000 or more. So in order to not give one party in the case preferential treatment, let's say someone lives in Ohio, another person lives in Michigan, uh, you wouldn't want the Ohio person to get preferential treatment in Ohio and likewise the same for the Michigan person in Michigan. So they can go to federal court as long as it involves something over $75,000. Then there are criminal cases. Federal criminal cases are actually quite limited. These are trials for violations of federal crimes. So things like wire fraud, money laundering, uh, terrorism, etc. And then the appeals for federal crimes go through the federal system as well. One way in which state court crime, uh, criminal cases can get into federal court is after a conviction there's a procedure called habeas corpus. And habeas corpus appeals are generally appeals that say something like this. Um, I, I know I was convicted below, but the, the court below, let's say in Michigan, violated my constitutional rights um, by not eliminated evidence that was found under an unlawful search and seizure. So that's a habeas corpus appeal. It's a criminal appeal that challenges the constitutionality of a crime in federal or state court. State cases are pretty much everything else. So civil cases are any tort. So any, you know, wrongful action like a slip and fall or an intentional infliction of emotional distress. Uh, those are state cases. Contract cases, if you have a contract with someone, generally that goes to uh, state court. Um, and state statutory claims, so different states have different statutes you can sue under. And then all family matter claims, divorce, adoption, marriage, etc., name change, that all goes through the state court system. And then most crimes are also state crimes. Murder is typically a state crime. Theft is typically a state crime. Most of those things never get to federal court. Um, and most things fall into the state court systems. So the, the kind of uh, juiciest part of talking about the judicial branch is, of course, the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court is a uh, bench, long bench, with nine justices sitting behind it, uh, hearing cases. And they generally hear two types of cases, original jurisdiction and appellate jurisdiction cases. There are nine justices on the court. Congress could technically change this. They could change it to 13. They could change it to 7. Uh, but as of now, there are nine. One chief justice and eight associate justices. And the jurisdiction needs to be uh, talked about here. So the original jurisdiction, these are a few cases a year where um, the case goes directly to the Supreme Court and only to the Supreme Court sometimes, uh, but directly to the Supreme Court. So you have a right to take the case directly to the Supreme Court with these few cases. These are the only types of cases talked about in the Constitution. In Article 3, Section 2, it gives you four ways in which you can have original jurisdiction at SCOTUS. One is a dispute between the states, and not only does that have the right to go directly to the Supreme Court, that's the only place where those cases can go, is to the Supreme Court. So if Michigan sues Ohio, that case goes directly to the Supreme Court. Uh, cases involving ambassadors or public ministers of foreign states. Uh, controversies between the United States and a state. So if the federal government sued Michigan, that would go to uh, the Supreme Court. And actions or proceedings by a state against the citizens of another state. Uh, that goes to the Supreme Court. So those are the original jurisdiction cases. Everything else will start down at that district court level. Uh, so this is the court's primary role. 99% of what they do is uh, deciding whether to hear these cases and hearing these appellate jurisdiction cases. And the reason why I say deciding to hear them is because there's no automatic appeal to the Supreme Court. If you get a decision you don't like at that circuit court level, you have to apply for what is called a petition for a writ of certiorari, 
uh, or petition for writ of cert or petition for cert um, for short, but petition for writ of certiorari. Um, and the court has to grant it and then docket your case for you to be heard at that court. And less than 1% of cases make it through this process. Um, so it's unlikely that the Supreme Court is going to take your case. Uh, the case only gets taken when four justices on the court agree to hear the case. So four of the nine. It's called the rule of four. And the factors in determining whether to hear a case usually boil down to this. Is there an unresolved issue of legal interpretation? Not factual interpretation, but legal interpretation. Uh, and typically that involves one that has one circuit deciding it one way and another circuit deciding it another way. So what that's called a circuit split. Uh, less than 1% of all petitions for cert are granted. So you can see how small of a portion of the cases this is, but yet that's most of what the Supreme Court does. So this is the path from the federal courts. Typically, the most common path is district court, circuit court, Supreme Court, if you get that writ granted. But there is a way in which you can appeal a state Supreme Court decision to the Supreme Court, and that is when a state Supreme Court interprets the federal, federal constitution. So let's say there's a case in Michigan and it involves some state issues and some federal issues, so it's in state court. Um, it's a criminal case, most likely. That's usually when this comes up. It goes up to the Michigan Supreme Court, and there's a question about the Fourth Amendment right of search and seizure against search and seizure. Uh, the the uh, decision could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court could hear the case just on that part involving the federal constitution. They don't get to decide on the state court claims, just on the federal ones. But the most common is this district court, circuit court uh, path. Then, let's say your petition is granted. You um, are one of the 1% of cases that gets heard by the Supreme Court. The first step is to submit written briefs. These are documents that detail the legal and factual arguments of the parties involved in the case. Then the court schedules your oral arguments where you go and they ask questions and you give answers. Finally, the decision uh, that, the case uh, that the court renders is called an opinion. The majority opinion is the one that represents the official de decision of the court. The one that gets the most votes behind it uh, is the one that's the official ruling. There's also dissenting opinions that disagree with the ruling and concurring opinions which agree with the end result but want to write for some other reason. Uh, so sometimes they think there's different reasons it should have been found that way or they just want to add something. Uh, a couple of other players in the Supreme Court. <coughs> A couple of other players include uh, the petitioner and respondent. So people get confused by this. The petitioner does not necessarily mean the plaintiff below, but it's the party that wants the decision of the appellate court overturned. The respondent is the one who likes the decision below. Law clerks. Each justice has their own law clerks. Um, and this is one of the most prestigious post-law school jobs you can get, probably the most prestigious, unless somehow you get right out of law school and are appointed to the Supreme Court. But these are people who are usually attending Ivy League law schools or top-tier law schools and uh, are getting set up for a pretty, uh, pretty prestigious legal career. And then finally, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the Solicitor General. I must clarify with you, write this down, the Solicitor General is not the Attorney General. These are two separate entities. The Solicitor General is the uh, attorney that presents the position of the United States federal government to the Supreme Court. That is their primary job, is to go to the Supreme Court and say what the federal government thinks on an issue involving the federal government. Uh, and sometimes they're parties to the case, and sometimes the Supreme Court just says, well, then we want to hear what the federal government has to say about this case. Uh, they are different from the Attorney General. The Attorney General is the top prosecutor of the country. The Solicitor General is kind of the top appellate attorney for the government. These are two different people. The Solicitor General argues before the Supreme Court. Now, we turn to an issue of judicial 
uh, review and judicial interpretation in the case of Marbury versus Madison. The issue in this case is whether Marbury can take his post as a justice of the peace for Washington, D.C. Jefferson was building a country and he had a very extended vision of where things were going to go. And I think he became pretty hardcore about people who got in the way. And he saw Marshall as someone who was getting in the way. The swearing in of Thomas Jefferson has got to be one of the great ironic moments in American history because you have Chief Justice Marshall uh, swearing in his second cousin, Thomas Jefferson, and both men pretty much by that time hated one another. They feel that the policies represented by the other person was detrimental to American civilization. It was as fundamental as that. So you have Marshall holding the Bible, Jefferson swearing to uphold the Constitution, which Marshall was absolutely sure he was going to destroy. The first fight between Jefferson and Marshall was a fight picked by John Adams on his way out of town. That quarrel would spill into the United States Supreme Court. On paper, Marbury versus Madison involved a small technical question of administrative housekeeping. But in the political swirl of 1801, this seemingly straightforward legal case would determine the future of the court and test the cunning and ability of the new 45-year-old Chief Justice. Marbury versus Madison began with another breathtaking act of partisanship by the outgoing President John Adams. Just weeks before Jefferson's inauguration, the lame duck Federalist Congress had passed legislation swelling the federal courts, and Adams stuffed them full of anti-Jeffersonians. At the very end, literally the last day of Adams' presidency, he was busy signing commissions for these federal judgeships, including these justices of the peace. And the hour got very late, and he had to get the commission signed, and then they were sent over to the Secretary of State, who happened to be John Marshall. And Marshall had to put the seal of the United States on it, and then they were to be delivered to these designated justices of the peace. John Marshall knows he can't deliver them all. He gives about half of them to his brother James to deliver. Um, James doesn't get around to delivering them um, before time runs out. The key lesson of Marbury versus Madison is don't give important documents to your brother. Of course, that's not the only important lesson of Marbury versus Madison. Uh, that is the factual background of Marbury versus Madison. The legal background uh, becomes a little more complex. The question that ultimately had to be decided is whether the Supreme Court could invalidate a law of Congress. The reason being is that Marbury, instead of going to district court, um, filing a case and then going through the appeals, went directly to the Supreme Court. And he did so under this provision of the Judiciary Act called a writ of mandamus. And the writ of mandamus, you don't need to understand it, but it's essentially something that would allow someone to go to the, directly to the Supreme Court to be heard. Uh, and the Supreme Court said in its decision that this part of the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional, that the writ of mandamus was not part of the framers' intent in writing the Constitution. And so the court ruled actually on two things. The first was that it had the power to review acts of Congress, that in essentially all legislation passed by Congress was subject to the power of judicial review by the courts and ultimately the Supreme Court uh, as the ultimate arbiter of what is constitutional. So in this case, it was that part of the Judiciary Act of 1789 that 
small part that dealt with the writ of mandamus that was ruled unconstitutional. But ultimately what the court says that sets up this idea of what is called judicial review is the idea that it is the job of the courts to look at the laws passed by Congress and in, um, enacted or implemented by the administrative branch. So the court says it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. This is nowhere in the Constitution, but this is exactly what we have empowered the Supreme Court to do ever since 1803, and according to Marshall and probably good judgment, we did that before, it's just this is the first time it's written down. So the Supreme Court is not just the last stop, but it is the last, uh, it is the top of the judicial branch of government. And the judicial branch of government is uh, tasked with determining what is and is not a constitutional exercise of the law. So when people talk about judicial review in the contemporary sense, what they are talking about is the way in which certain judges and justices look at the Constitution and how they interpret it um, in terms of an ideology, a legal ideology about how the world works. And generally what they mean is, is someone an originalist or does someone believe in what's called the living Constitution? Now these are two extremes on a very broad spectrum and very few people if anybody actually falls at those two extremes um, people will say well you know Justice Scalia when he was alive was a true originalist there are times when Justice Scalia did not write opinions that were actually in line with the originalist line of thought but let's talk about these not because they are representative of everybody but because they actually represent the spectrum. So on one side, you have the originalists who read the text of the Constitution and say, this is what the framers intended this to mean, and we are not going to interpret it any differently. In other words, they look at it, see what the founders meant, and use that meaning, even if it isn't totally applicable today, um, as what the Constitution means. And if you want to change that meaning, they say, you have to actually amend the Constitution to do that. On the other end of the scale, you have people who believe in more of a living constitution, that the constitution has to be reinterpreted over the years to m coincide with modern terms and modern technology and modern life uh, in a way that is relevant to the legal and social issues of the day. Now, what this doesn't say is that most living constitution scholars actually do believe in starting with some interpretation of the Constitution that was set up by the framers. Um, because that is not kind of a beginning point, it's an end point. And also what this doesn't say is that originalists often are confounded with new technology that the founders couldn't have possibly anticipated. How would the founders have dealt with, for example, cell phone data and how that can be used in search and seizure? Um, so they have to, you know, find some sort of middle ground. But these are the two predominant schools of thought. Again, most people fall somewhere in the middle um, along a range of particular thoughts. So that brings us to Brutus 15. Um, Brutus is one of our anti-federalist papers, so it shouldn't be surprising that what Brutus is doing here is laying out an argument against the judicial structure of the new constitution or the proposed constitution. And in particular, Brutus is talking about the danger the Supreme Court um, creates for this new nation. So he has a few arg arguments in doing this, and some of them should sound very familiar to you. So the first should be very familiar because it was just the previous slide. Um, he says, and this is pre-Marbury because Marbury was not until 1803, that the Supreme Court will be engaged in judicial review, which ultimately makes it the highest branch. Um, he outlines what he sees the role of the Supreme Court being, and he says this is going to be judicial review. This is really interesting because judicial review is not particularly spelled out in the Constitution. There's no way in which it's it's named that, nor is the practice really defined in the Constitution. And it wasn't until Marbury versus Madison that judicial review became an accepted practice of the court. And even then, 
um, that was particularly um, fraught with with problematic um, responses. So Brutus recognizes, though, that the Constitution permits and even requires in some cases that the court engage in judicial review. So he says judicial review is going to happen. And he says this is dangerous because it affords judges the ability to, quote, determine what is the extent of the powers of Congress, end quote, which sounds very familiar um, to what um, Marshall said in Marbury versus Madison. So this makes the court and the entire judiciary more powerful than Congress in Brutus's eyes. He also argues that the lifetime appointment feature of the federal judiciary is dangerous because it becomes more powerful than other branches that have to stand for re-election in regular intervals. Um, so this sets out kind of that push and pull, whether you want an in, a truly independent judiciary, you know, once they're appointed and confirmed, the judiciary no longer has to sit for regular reviews by Congress or the president. So they do become independent in a way. And Brutus says that this makes them prone to kind of having a will all their own which may be true. The counter argument, of course, um, that the Federalists argued, um, but that we're not reading here, is that lifetime, appoint that, uh, lifetime appointment insulates them from the political whims of the day. It makes it impossible for, um, example, for Barack Obama to throw out all the judges appointed by George W. Bush or Donald Trump to throw out all the judges appointed by Barack Obama. So, that kind of keeps ju judges in place for a long period of time. And given the judge, the role of judges, um, a lot of people feel that that is um, of particular use. Interestingly here, Brutus spells out what high crimes and misdemeanors means in the contemporary sense as it relates to impeachment. Now here he's talking about um, judges and Supreme Court justices. Um, but... Um, in these days when we talk about impeachment so much and say, well, we don't really know what high crimes or misdemeanors means, Brutus kind of spells it out what he believes it means, and that is the contemporary notion of high crimes and misdemeanors. So going on, he also says that no one can correct the Supreme Court's missteps. In other words, there's no court above the Supreme Court, and their decisions are not reviewable by Congress. And in fact, Congress has tried to kind of undo some of their decisions. And times they can because it's based on legislation, and times they can't because it's based on the Constitution. So Brutus has a point here. The final point is kind of the reason why I included the Freddie Mercury so close meme here. Because Brutus says that the all-powerful federal judiciary, in particular the federal Supreme Court, will make the state courts pretty much useless. Um, so Brutus spells out what high crimes and misdemeanors means in the contemporary sense. So he has two other kind of um, critiques of the court. The first is that there's no branch higher than the Supreme Court as far as he's concerned. Because they can make determinations on whether something that Congress does is appropriate, um, then he feels that they are actually above Congress in terms of this, the setup of this Constitution. And in some ways, he's right. If Congress um, tries to undo something that the court does, and it, it was ultimately um, an issue of constitutional interpretation, the court has routinely shut Congress down on that. However, if it's something of legislative interpretation, um, Congress can review the legislation and rewrite it. So you're starting to see why maybe I have that meme there where it says so close, because Brutus has some good points here, but they always kind of come up to the point of being true and then maybe have some uh, unfulfilled prophecy about them. And the final one has, I think, a lot of unfulfilled prophecy about it, which is that he argues that the Supreme Court and the federal courts in general will make the state court systems useless and eventually lead to their abolishment. He says um, people were 
concerned with putting in place a court system that would make the states um, useless and burdensome is, is the words he uses um, because no one will want to use the state court systems now that they have the federal court system and it's so great and has all these powers and all of that. Uh, Brutus is actually, um, he's in one sense onto something in that federal courts have more power than maybe the framers initially anticipated. However, state courts are largely people's connection point with the judicial system. Everything that we talked about that goes through the state courts is the bulk of our legal action in the United States. There are attorneys who never practice in federal court. They only go to state courts. There are people who have never been inside of a federal court. Many people, most people are never inside of a federal court. But many people have gone inside of a state court from time to time for various matters. So Brutus probably has the longest shot argument here, um, and hence the meme, so close. So this is the end of our discussion, but I wanted to leave you with a thought, and that is the Supreme Court really isn't that diverse, and we've only touched on that barely here. Um, I touch a lot about it uh, in, in my institutions class, in my civil liberties class, and we just don't have a ton of time here. But even intellectually and in terms of schooling, they are not very diverse. So I want you to keep that in mind when you're thinking about maybe the arguments against the federal court system in particular, um, because they are less diverse than the state courts in general.